Charlie Baker, 4051-23, U-110, Interrogation of Survivors, May 1941, Naval Intelligence Division, Admiralty, SW-1. The following report is compiled from information derived from prisoners of war. The statements made cannot always be verified. They should therefore not be accepted as facts unless they are definitely stated to be confirmed by information from other sources. Table of Contents Section 1. Introductory Remarks 2. Remarks on Crew of U-110 3. Early History of U-110 4. First Cruise of U-110 5. Last Cruise of U-110 6. Sinking of U-110 7. Details of U-110 8. U-Boat Flotillas 9. Other U-Boats 10. U-Boat Losses 11. U-Boat Bases 12. General Remarks on U-Boats 13. Propaganda Company 14. Conditions in Concentration Camps Appendices 1. Translation of a diary written by the Chief Quartermaster of U-110 2. List of Crew of U-110 Report of Interrogation of Survivors of U-110 Sunk at 12.25 on Friday, 9th May, 1941 In position 60 degrees north and 14 degrees west Section 1 Introductory Remarks The sinking of U-110 on 9th May, 1941 was a further blow not only to the strength of the U-boat branch of the German Navy, but also to the morale of U-boat crews, as U-110 was only on her second cruise, had achieved very meager results, and her captain, Captain Lieutenant Fritz Julius Lemp, was one of the few remaining officers of the old gang who were in command of U-boats at the beginning of the war. Prisoners admitted that the German Navy has great and increasing respect for the British new U-boat detecting instrument, and remarks were repeatedly made to the effect that a U-boat located by that instrument was doomed beyond hope of escape. The opinion was openly expressed that German naval circles realized that U-boats will not achieve a decisive victory or bring about an adequate blockade of Great Britain. The Luftwaffe, it was urged, must sink more and more of Britain's ships. Section 2. Remarks on the crew of U-110 The complement of U-110 consisted of four officers, 15 petty officers, 27 ratings, totaling 46, a war correspondent with rank of a temporary sub-lieutenant was also carried. When the U-boat was sunk, the captain, three petty officers, and eleven ratings lost their lives. The captain, Captain Lieutenant Fritz Julius Lemp, was an officer of considerable experience and ability and enjoyed a certain prestige among U-boat captains. He was born on 9th February 1913 in Tsingtao, in the then German colony of Kiaochao, his father being an army officer. He entered the Navy on 1st April 1931 and was appointed to his first command in 1938. His war career in command of U-30 and U-110 is traced later in this report. He was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross on 22nd August 1940. Prisoners estimated his total sinkings at about 140,000 tons of shipping. This figure is greatly in excess of fact. He was apparently much respected and liked by his crew, 
who described him as having been an even-tempered man of unshakable calm and great determination. The first lieutenant, Oberleutnant Thursi Dietrich Lowe, was extremely unpopular with the crew, who thought him brainless and inefficient. They looked on him as a Jonah, as the torpedo boat Lux in which he was then serving was lost early in the war, and the destroyer in which Lowe served at Narvik was also sunk. He belonged to a family of landed gentry in Mecklenburg, and was a cousin of Lemp. Lowe was an ardent Nazi and could tolerate no criticism of the Nazi regime. He was also narrow-minded, callous, brutal, and a bully. His lack of naval experience was explained by the statement that he had been on sick leave for several months, as he suffered from fainting fits. Lowe's father is a retired naval officer, and his brother is Captain Lieutenant Axel Olaf Lowe, who has some appointment ashore. The junior officer, Lieutenant Zersi Ulrich Werhofer, was also considered extremely unreliable, and the chief petty officers did not trust him to carry out properly any important observation or calculation. Although a native of Danzig, he prided himself on being a German and adopted a reasonable tone when discussing National Socialism. He gave the impression of possessing moderate intelligence, but of lacking general knowledge. The engineer officer, Oberleutnant Engineer Hans Joachim Eichelborn, was quite a pleasant type, and was considered by the crew of U-110 to be an excellent engineer. It was stated that he would have shortly become the engineer officer of a U-boat flotilla. He is the son of a country schoolmaster in a small town near Berlin, and is married. He spoke some English, and showed no animosity towards Great Britain. He expressed great admiration for Hitler, and professed to be convinced of an ultimate German victory, although he was by no means a fanatical Nazi. He was reasonably well-educated, and a man of some sensibility. The war correspondent, Leutnant Sir C. Sonderführer, temporary sub-lieutenant, Helmut Eck, is mentioned in greater detail later in this report under the heading Propaganda Company. Although he had never been in a U-boat before, Eck professed not to have been irked by the confined conditions on board, as he did not want to be regarded purely as a passenger, he took his turn on watch as Conning Tower lookout. He said that he took between 200 and 300 photographs of life in the U-boat. During the sinking of U-110, the first lieutenant, pointing out the terrified faces of the panic-stricken crew, remarked to Eck that there he might observe something worth writing about in his propaganda articles. While Eck, like all the other survivors, repeatedly expressed his gratitude for the very generous treatment accorded him in the British destroyer, he was furiously indignant at being taken to Brixton Prison on arrival in London. He bitterly resented being clothed in prison garments, and the attitude of mind engendered by this indignity had to be counteracted before any information could be extracted from him. He remained so bitterly resentful, however, at this example of the way in which the English treat their prisoners of war, that he intends featuring the incident in a book which he hopes to write for publication after the war. The petty officers were nearly all men of considerable experience who had served under Lemp on most of the cruises of U-30. He seems to have been unusually successful in retaining his experienced men. Many of the ratings had been drafted without option, and were very raw and ill-trained and some were on their first cruise when U-110 was sunk. They did not stand up to an emergency and became panic-stricken at the first sign of action. One man had undergone an operation for rupture some six weeks before the last cruise, but was nevertheless 
obliged to take his place on board. A second rating was reputed to have communistic leanings, but was nevertheless included in the crew. An even more astonishing fact was the inclusion of a man who had been in a concentration camp and had suffered appalling cruelty at the hands of the Nazis. This man was entrusted with important and responsible duties, although he must have been classed by the German naval authorities as an irreconcilable in view of his and his family's sufferings. While he was somewhat taciturn on the subject of his past, other members of the crew discussed the conditions in concentration camps. This man had been a merchant service officer and was carried for navigational duties. He was graded as a petty officer and would have automatically become a temporary commissioned officer after 18 months of service. He gave the impression of being a good type of German and was a man of considerable experience gained in many parts of the world. While the morale of the officers and petty officers was high, there were some signs of the abandonment of the unshakable conviction of Germany's ultimate victory. These doubts have not been noted before in any extent among U-boat prisoners. Frequent references to the infallibility of the new U-boat detecting instrument were made, and some senior petty officers admitted that during their later cruises, they had on each occasion vowed never to go to sea in a U-boat again. Section 3. Early History of U-110 U-110 is known to have been built in the Dashimag Yard, Bremen, and was presumably laid down towards the end of 1939 or early 1940, as the first members of her complement were drafted towards the end of September 1940 to stand by the U-boat during the final stages of construction. Her job number was W-973. She was commissioned in Bremen on 21st October 1940 and attached to the second U-boat flotilla. She is one of the series U-103 to U-111, all of which are 750-ton boats built at this yard. During this period, the crew was housed in Hutmans north of the Kahafen, about 15 minutes' walk from the building yard, according to prisoners, who added that U-boats were built in the e Hafen and f Hafen. The officers who had served in U-30 were appointed to U-110, namely Captain Lieutenant Lemp, Oberleutnant Sir C. Gregor, Oberleutnant Sir C. Lowe, and Lieutenant Sir C. Verhofer. The U-boat was completed and proceeded to Kiel in November 1940. Her acceptance trials were carried out on 7th November 1940, and on 22nd November, further trials were commenced, beginning with trimming tests. These trials were carried out, as usual, in the Baltic, and after remaining in Kiel for about two weeks, U-110 spent some weeks at Danzig, leaving again about 10th January 1941. It was stated the torpedo firing practice was done in order to test the torpedo tubes only, and the torpedoes were not aimed at specific targets. No practice attacks on convoys were made by U-110, nor were attacks in cooperation with other U-boats practiced, but the crew was transferred to three or four other U-boats to carry out these exercises, as U-110's periscope became defective and required readjustment. Defects in the diesels and electric motors also developed. The last week of January was spent in Pulau. Later on, U-110 proceeded to Varnamunde, leaving at the end of February. She was said to have been considerably delayed by ice conditions, and a new icebreaker proved somewhat inefficient. The U-boat returned to Kiel about 4th March 1941. Section 4. First Cruise of U-110 
U-110 left Kiel on her first war cruise on 9th March 1941, carrying a complement of four officers and 43 men. Prisoners stated that she carried 14 torpedoes, of which six were in her tubes, two reserves above and four below the floor plates in the forward compartment, and two above the floor plates in the after compartment. She proceeded through Kiel Canal, but appears to have been delayed at Brunsbüttel by fog. Here the U-boat's ice protector, ice schutz, was removed. It had been arranged to do this work at Cookshaven, but Lemp particularly wished to have it done at Brunsbüttel. U-110 did not proceed until 11th March 1941, on which date she made two short routine dives from 1625 to 1632, and from 1634 to 1653, German time. On the following day, 12th March, the U-boat crash-dived three times, from 0654 to 0734, from 1335 to 1355, and from 1430 to 2005, German time, presumably as a result of aircraft having been reported. U-10 was found to be too heavy forward and touched bottom. The quartermaster stated that U-110 proceeded along the Norwegian coast about 40 miles from land until she reached a position off Bergen, after which she passed through the Fair Isle Channel in the early morning of 13th March. One member of the crew noted in his diary that he had seen land when passing the Shetlands. Prisoners claimed to have seen a convoy on 14th March in an area about 120 to 150 miles south of Iceland where U-boats were said to be forbidden to attack. The convoy was reported to the Vice Admiral U-boats and U-110 followed it and maintained contacts. Other U-boats, including U-99, Captain Lieutenant Kretschmer, and U-100, Captain Lieutenant Schepke, were ordered to proceed to intercept and attack this convoy later. NID Note As mentioned in Charlie Baker 405120, page 20, U-110 was stated by prisoners captured at an earlier date to have sighted a convoy and to have followed it for some days, transmitting reports at intervals to the Vice Admiral U-boats. The convoy appears to have been Howe X-Ray 112. The 14th and 15th March were otherwise uneventful, and the U-boat proceeded mainly on the surface as usual, carrying out only one or two very short trial dives and was said to have continued to shadow the convoy. It was claimed that U-110 sank in this convoy one tanker for certain and possibly a second tanker on the night of 15th, 16th, March 1941. The ship sunk was described as a 16,000 ton tanker which burned fiercely for some time after having been hit by a torpedo from a range of 600 meters or 656 yards. A reliable prisoner stated that U-110 fired three bow torpedoes during the attack on these two tankers, and other prisoners added that at least one stern torpedo was fired as well. NID Note The tanker Aerodona, 6,207 tons in convoy Howe X-Ray 112, was attacked by a U-boat at 2215 BST on 15th March 1941, in position 61 degrees by 20 north and 17 degrees west. Survivors stated that the U-boat turned her stern towards the tanker and fired a torpedo from her stern tubes, which caused the Irodona to burst into flames immediately. At daybreak, the ship was still burning, but was subsequently towed to Iceland in a parlous condition. Prisoners said that after these attacks, U-110 was attacked by destroyers, which dropped about 24 depth charges without damaging the U-boat, 
which had dived to 100 meters, 328 feet. NID note, 12 depth charges were dropped by HMS Volunteer and HMS Vanuk following the torpedoing of Aerodonna, but neither ship obtained good ASDIC contact. They described the ships of the convoy passing over them and claimed that they then surfaced and fired a torpedo at an 8,000-ton tanker which they believed to have sunk. On 16 March 1941, U-110 crash-dived at 0031 and surfaced at 0140. Later, she dived again at 0900 to 1123. From 1640 to 1720, from 2007 to 2014, and from 2210 to 2245. An entry in a ratings diary alludes to an attack in cooperation with Shepke, Kretschmer, and Paulson. The attack referred to is the attack on convoy How X-Ray 112 on the night of 16th, 17th March, 1941, when U-99, Kretschmer, and U-100, Shepke, were sunk after a number of ships in convoy had been torpedoed. NID note. Oberleutnant Zer C. Autokar Paulsen is known to command U-557. But other prisoners, although they knew of the attack and admitted having been in the vicinity and having heard the detonations of depth charges dropped by the British destroyers, stated that U-110 did not take part in that attack. On 17th March 1941, U-110 dived on three occasions for a short time. Prisoners stated that U-110 wanted to attack the convoy on the next night, 17th, 18th March, but failed to maintain contact and so lost the convoy. On 18th March, she also dived once, from 10.15 to 10.45. The diarist made an entry to the effect that Kretschmer was missing. On 19th, 20th, and 21st March were also uneventful days. U-110 remaining on the surface except for a few dives of short duration. On 22nd March, she was stated to have sighted a small steamer and to have followed her all day but was prevented by the presence of an aircraft and destroyers from attacking. The U-boat crash-dived on three occasions and prisoners stated that at night, when in the most western part of their operation area, they attacked by gunfire this ship and also another small British ship proceeding independently. Prisoners said that, after one shot, there was an explosion in the gun, owing to a defect in the shell, and the gun was damaged. Shell splinters also slightly damaged the deck. Germans wanted to fire a second shell, but the whole gun was described as having become twisted. It was added that the attacked ships were armed and escaped. NID Note The Norwegian SS Seiermalm, 2,468 tons, was attacked by a U-boat at 0230 GMT on 23rd March 1941 in position 60 degrees by 35 north and 28 degrees by 25 west but escaped. U-110 was rendered unfit to crash dive by some damage to her periscope. It was also established that her gun became defective and remained out of action for the rest of the cruise. On 24th March, U-10 was mentioned in a diary as having started on her homeward cruise to Lorient. Presumably, the periscope defect was repaired as the U-boat was able to crash dive from 1328 to 1342. The following days were uneventful, U-110 proceeding on the surface all the time except for short spells submerged or at periscope depth. She was stated to have maintained the uneconomical speed of 16 knots on the surface. The alarm was sounded once on 28th March due to aircraft being reported. Prisoners stated that U-110 was never attacked by aircraft. On Saturday, 29th March, 1941, U-110 arrived at Lorient, 
the cylinder heads of the diesels had cracked, according to prisoners. On her arrival, U-110 was said to have had nine or ten torpedoes remaining on board. Vice Admiral Dönitz inspected the crew on the following day and awarded two Iron Crosses first class. Some of the crew went on leave, and the others were housed in the von Dretzky and Frolich wings of the Salzwedel barracks, formerly the harbor barracks. U-110 spent six or seven days in dry dock, according to prisoners, who added that no other U-boat was in the same dry dock at the time. Oberleutnant Zersee Gregor was replaced by Oberleutnant Zersee Lowe. It was stated that U-110 was intended to have gone on a cruise towards the south as far as the equator, but that this plan was countermanded about 12th April 1941, and it was arranged that her area of operations should be in the North Atlantic. Section 5. Last Cruise of U-110 U-110 left Lorient on her last cruise at 19.32 on 15th April with 15 torpedoes on board. She was accompanied by a patrol vessel for about half an hour and later carried out a test dive of three quarters of an hour's duration. A war correspondent was on board in addition to the complement of four officers and 42 men. On the following day, 16th April 1941, the U-boat proceeded on a course of 235 degrees for six hours, which was altered to 280 degrees, and again at 2200 to 320 degrees. She crash-dived five times. On 17th April, there was nothing to report. Only a test dive was carried out, and at 2200 course was altered to 300 degrees, which was maintained throughout the 18th April, on which day U-110 crash-dived once. On 20th April, she was believed to have been west of Ireland. The following period until 26th April was uneventful, the U-boat proceeding on the surface nearly all the time and altering course many times. She submerged on several occasions to listen on her hydrophones. On 26th April, a steamer was sighted. At 0130 on 27th April, U-110 sank from a range of 300 meters, 328 yards, the French André Moirand, a 2,500-ton ship sailing alone under the orders of the Vichy government. One torpedo from a bow tube was fired. It was stated that a Russian survivor was rescued, given a bottle of spirits, and placed in a lifeboat. Prisoners believed this ship to have had a cargo of iron ore. Later in the day, a short test dive was carried out. Another ship was sighted but not attacked. Two steamers reported on 28th April were described as having been too far away to be worth pursuing, although U-110 made a short-lived attempt to do so. A report was received on 5th May 1941 from Vice Admiral U-Boats that a convoy of about 50 ships escorted by 15 destroyers was being formed near the Hebrides. It is possible that the convoy referred to was Oscar Baker 318, consisting of 37 ships and 10 escort vessels on 5th May, increased to 13 escort vessels on 8th May 1941. A reliable statement was obtained to the effect that U-110 had completed 1,000 miles at 20.30 on 6th May 1941. Prisoners believed that the convoy had been sighted in the first place by aircraft and reported to the Vice Admiral commanding U-boats who ordered U-110 and other U-boats to intercept and attack the convoy. At 2400 on this date, course was altered to 270 degrees. On 8th May, aircraft were reported at 0645 and 0830 U-110 being forced to dive. She surfaced at 0900, but seven minutes later dived again on sighting a destroyer and remained submerged for an hour. At 1815, on the same evening, 
Smoke was seen ahead on the port bow. Prisoners state that in spite of bad weather, U-110 closed the convoy during the night, 8th, 9th May, but was prevented from surfacing on the bright moonlight by the strong destroyer escort and did not dare to attack even from periscope depth. She therefore maintained contact with the convoy during the morning of 9th May. Prisoners did not know whether this convoy was the same one which had been reported as forming up near the Hebrides some days earlier, but they thought that it most probably was the same. During the forenoon of 9th May 1941, U-110 was stated to have been joined by U-201, Oberleutnant Zersi Schnee, and the captains conferred as to their course of action before proceeding independently. Schnee considered that the attack on the convoy should not be postponed longer than necessary, and it was agreed that U-110 should attack first, and that U-201 should attack half an hour later. Eck the war correspondent said that he shot a film on a miniature film camera of the meeting of the two U-boat commanders and of the second U-boat proceeding away and submerging. This film, together with his photographs and cameras, he believes went down with the U-boat. He said that the films would have been an excellent feature for the British news cinemas. Prisoners believe that a third U-boat was in the immediate vicinity and that this may have been either U-96 Captain Lieutenant Lehmann Willenbrock or U-553 Captain Lieutenant Thurman. A reliable and knowledgeable prisoner expressed the opinion that there were eight U-boats operating in the North Atlantic at this time, while a chief petty officer also estimated that the total number of U-boats operating was eight all in the North Atlantic. The quartermaster urged Lemp to postpone the attack as he felt sure that the escort were about to leave the convoy, which would therefore become an easy prey. Although Lemp would have preferred to wait until nightfall, it was realized that U-110 was already very far to the west. In fact, further west than, in the opinion of prisoners, a U-boat attack had ever been made. U-110 was said to have had three electric and one air torpedo in her bow tubes at this juncture, and to have replaced the air torpedo by a fourth electric torpedo. Prisoners stated that U-110 dived at 12.37 German time and at 12.39 fired three electric torpedoes with intervals of 30 seconds. The Germans believed that three ships of 5,000 to 7,000 tons were hit and sunk. They claimed to have heard three explosions. NID note. Esmond, 4,976 tons, and SS Bangorhead, 2,609 tons, in convoy Oscar Baker 318, were torpedoed and sunk at 1410 NST, on 9th May 1941 in position 60 degrees by 28 north and 32 by 40 west. The order was given to fire the fourth bow torpedo with the object of sinking a ship believed to have been a whale factory of 15,000 tons. The order was passed on by the engineer officer and the tube was flooded but for some reason there was a misfire which resulted in an argument between the first lieutenant and the engineer officer. U-110 carried out her attack from periscope depth and according to prisoners did not dive immediately, but waited to observe the results. Several men stated that the U-boat intended to attack a large ship and at this juncture was almost in position to do so but she was forced to crash dive when she saw a destroyer coming straight at her. The survivors of U-110 claimed that they had sunk on this last cruise four ships totaling 17,500 tons. Their actual sinkings were three ships amounting to 10,085 tons. Section 6. 
sinking of U-110. The quartermaster stated that the attacking destroyer passed immediately over the crash diving U-110 at 12.23 GMT and dropped a pattern of depth charges which caused great damage inside the U-boat. He said that the depth gauge was smashed, but that a spare depth gauge operated by oil pressure in after compartment showed a depth of 84 meters, 275.6 feet, soon after the first depth charges exploded. But this instrument was described as unreliable and this statement should be accepted with reserve. Conflicting statements were made as to the number of depth charge attacks, but most prisoners stated that three patterns were dropped and that 18 explosions were heard. The Germans believed that the British now have a new and accurate system of dropping depth charges. The last pattern was described as having been particularly well aimed. The effect of these attacks was to wreck completely the interior of U-110. The hydroplanes were put out of action at an early stage, as was the rudder soon afterwards. The Rudder indicator was smashed, also the compasses. Oil from a damaged fuel tank penetrated into the U-boat near the galley. There was a certain degree of panic among the crew, most of whom rushed forward as the U-boat went down somewhat by the stern. Some men complained of having experienced difficulty in breathing. The U-boat's depth was now shown by the inaccurate spare manometer to having been about 95 meters, 311 feet. The captain hoped to escape on the electric motors, but these had also been put out of action. One battery had been damaged, and gas was produced. Realizing the impossibility of escape, he ordered tanks to be blown with the intention of surfacing but the wheel-like control of the blowing system was found to have been broken off and to be lying on the floor plates. The Germans considered that the depth charges must have exploded very close to U-110 to have done such damage. They added that the explosions were above them. For a few moments, consternation reigned among the crew, but an unexpected rocking movement told them that the U-boat had come to the surface in some unexplained way. One suggestion was that the suction of the water upwards resulting from the explosion of the depth charges may have drawn the U-boat upwards. The chief mechanician thought that the explosion of the depth charges, which had smashed the control of the blowing system, had at the same time turned on the air supply, which had then automatically blown all tanks. The conning tower hatch was opened quickly, and all hands were observed to abandon ship as quickly as possible. The captain stood on the bridge and hustled the men overboard into the water. He was subsequently seen swimming in the sea, and inquired of the first lieutenant and the engineer officer as to how the junior officer was, as he knew that the latter had only recently recovered from a long illness. Prisoners thought that an external fuel tank must have become damaged as there was a large quantity of oil on the sea. They added that the British opened fire on the U-boat and that some men were killed and others injured while abandoning ship or swimming. Eck, the war correspondent, said that at the time of the attack on the convoy he was ordered out of the control room. The next thing he heard was the tremendous explosion of a depth charge, which he described as far louder and more terrifying than anything he had ever heard on the Western Front. The explosion of Stuka airplane bombs included. He staggered to the control room, where Lemp immediately ordered him over the side. The next thing he remembered was swimming in the sea. He had on leather breeches and boots, and he was not able to inflate his rubber life belt. He is a good swimmer, and said that he managed to keep afloat, although he swallowed a great quantity of water and oil. While in the water, he claimed that he was shot at. He did not expect to be rescued, but he was finally picked up by a submarine chaser. 
Lemp, he believed, intended to commit suicide by going down with the U-boat, but the U-boat did not sink. It is possible that he threw himself over the side and deliberately allowed himself to be carried away. The engineer officer who had given his escape apparatus to the chief mechanician, whose own had become damaged, had been washed overboard and was among those rescued by the British. The wireless telegraph petty officer stated that it was impossible to send a signal to their base reporting their last claims or the sinking of their U-boat. The Germans stated that when they last saw their U-boat, her stern was under water with the conning tower and bows projecting. Four officers, including the war correspondent, and 28 men were rescued, but the captain and 14 men lost their lives. An ID note. U-201 is believed to have carried out her part of the plan of attack as arranged as Empire Cloud 5,969 tons and Grigalia 5,802 tons were torpedoed at about 1438 on 9th May 1941, 36 minutes after U-110 had attacked the convoy. The former of these ships was, however, not sunk, but was later towed to port. Section 7. Details of U-110 General Remarks U-110 was stated to have a displacement of 750 tons and to have had a double hull. Apart from that, she was said to have been very like the earlier type of U-boat and had few, if any, improvements. She was painted gray. Telegraph orders, powers, and speed of the U-boat Type 9 U-103 to U-111. A. Designed speeds. The following lists telegraph orders, revolutions, speed in knots per hour, fuel consumption per day by 100 miles, days, and radius of action. Fuel capacity, 168 cubic meters. Speed for U-110. Following list, main engines, telegraph orders for both diesels and one diesel revolutions and speed in knots ranging from 5 to 17. Motors revolutions and speed in knots going from 2 to 7.5. Cruising speed, both diesels 12 knots, one diesel 9 knots. Following plan of tanks and bunkers, glossary of terms used in plate 1, etc. Oil pressure, installation of periscopes, glossary of terms used in plate 2, etc. Main bilge installation, glossary of terms used in plate 3, etc. High pressure air system, glossary of terms used in plate 4, etc. Compartment ventilating installation, glossary of terms used in plate 5, etc. Main switch installation, glossary of terms used in plate 6, etc. Air bottles, A, in the upper deck, B, in the diesel motor compartment, C, in the electric motor compartment, etc. Radio direction finding. None of the U-boats sunk from which prisoners have been captured have been fitted with radio direction finding apparatus and it seems improbable that any U-boats carry it. Seaworthiness. The crew of U-110 were enthusiastic about the seaworthiness of their U-boat and claimed that she remained on the surface and behaved well even in seas 8 and 9. They added that the conning tower hatch remained open during bad weather and not, as was suggested, half closed. Stowage of torpedoes. Prisoners stated that in addition to the six torpedoes in her tubes, U-110 carried on each cruise eight spare torpedoes, of which two were stowed above and four below the floor plates in the forward compartment, and two above the floor plates in the stern compartment, 
It was added that the tapering of the hull towards the stern precluded the stowage of spare torpedo under the floor plates in the stern compartment. Prisoners stated that the practice of carrying spare torpedoes in containers on the upper deck had been greatly criticized and that the decision was now left to the captains themselves as to how many, if any, spare torpedoes should be carried in this way. Lemp was said to have thought the scheme impracticable, and U-110 had therefore had these containers removed before the U-boat's first cruise. U-110 had formerly had eight or ten of these upper-deck watertight torpedo containers. It was added that the space occupied by torpedo containers had been covered by metal plating, but after the removal of these were covered over with wood. It was denied that the space was now utilized for any other purposes. As the transfer of torpedoes from the upper deck containers to the interior of the U-boat could only be done in calm weather and in any case was a slow business, prisoners believed that most, if not all, the 750-ton type U-boats would probably have these containers removed. Diving Depth Prisoners stated that U-110 had never dived deeper than about 60 meters, 196.8 feet, apart from the depth attained in the action when she was sunk, and then there was considerable doubt as to the actual depth reached. Guns Prisoners stated that U-110 carried three guns, namely one 10.5 centimeter, 4.1 inch forward, one 3.7 centimeter, 1.45 inch aft, and one 2 centimeter on the bridge. Charging of batteries. Prisoners expressed the opinion that not much noise was produced while batteries were being charged as the exhaust was above the water line. Hydrophones. The wireless telegraph personnel had a high opinion of U-110's hydrophones, of which several were said to have been fitted in the bow of the U-boat on both sides. Detector gear. Detector gear S. Garret was not carried according to prisoners. Paraphone. It was also denied that a paraphone was fitted. Ice protector. Ice schutz. The fitting to protect the bow of U-110 against damage by ice was described as a metal protection extending aft from the bow for about 15 feet and covering the mouths of the bow torpedo tubes. This fitting was held together across the top by rods. The space between the hull of the U-boat and the ice protector was said to have been filled in with wood. Mines. It was emphatically denied that any mines were carried. Badge. As it was impossible to take his dog to sea in his earlier command, U-30, Lemp had a caricature of this terrier painted on the side of the conning tower. When he was appointed to command of U-110, he again adopted this badge. Section 8. U-Boat Flotillas. It is known that there are three active service flotillas. These are the first, second, and seventh flotillas. In addition, there are six flotillas stationed in the Baltic consisting of U-boats used for training and tactical exercises. These are numbered 321, 22, 24, 25, and 27. First U-Boat Flotilla About 1st March 1941, the first U-Boat Flotilla consisted of 11 U-Boats, which number may now have been increased by a further five. The commanding officer of the flotilla is Captain Lieutenant Hans Kohaus. This flotilla had been operating from Lorient, but it is believed that it was intended to be based on another French port. Brest was suggested in this connection. Second U-Boat Flotilla About 1st March 1941, the 2nd U-Boat Flotilla 
consisted of 21 U-boats of the 740 to 750 ton type and included U-110. The commanding officer of the flotilla is Corvette Captain Heinz Fischer. This flotilla is also based on Lorient and is believed to be intended to remain there. 7th U-Boat Flotilla About 1st March 1941, the 7th U-Boat Flotilla, commanded by Captain Lieutenant Herbert Soler, consisted of 26 500-ton U-Boats. Although this flotilla has been based on Lorient for many months, it has been suggested it may later be based on St. Nazaire. 3rd U-Boat Flotilla It is believed that the 3rd U-Boat Flotilla is based on Stettin in the Baltic. 21st U-Boat Flotilla The 21st U-Boat Flotilla was stated by prisoners to be based on Pilau and to consist of training U-Boats belonging to the 1st U-Boat Training Division, Euler Division. 22nd U-Boat Flotilla the 22nd U-Boat Flotilla was stated to be based on Gottenhafen, Gdynia, and also to consist of training U-Boats belonging to the 2nd U-Boat Training Division. Section 9. Other U-Boats U-28, U-29 It was confirmed that U-28 and U-29 were now being used for training and are attached to the 24th U-Boat Flotilla. U-30 U-30 was laid down at the Deutsche Schiff und Maschinenbau AG Deschkimag building yard at Bremen in October 1935 on the same day as U-28 and U-29 all the three U-Boats were of 500 tons. U-30 was launched on 4th April 1936 and completed on 8th October of the same year. U-30 was then allocated to the second U-boat flotilla Salzwedel. Her home port was Wilhelmshaven. Her complement 35 officers and men. The German Navy list of 1936 gives U-30's first commanding officer as Captain Lieutenant Kohaus with Oberleutnant Sir C. Behrens as First Lieutenant and Oberleutnant Engineer Lieutenant Winkler as First Engineer. The German Navy list of 1937 gives Captain Lieutenant Kohaus as commanding officer, Oberleutnant Sir C. Mugler as First Officer, and Oberleutnant Engineer Burkhardt, Herbert Alfred as first engineer. The exact date when Captain Lieutenant Lemp joined U 30 as commanding officer has not been definitely established, but evidence acquired from captured documents makes it clear that Captain Lieutenant Lemp was drafted to U 30 before the outbreak of war and that he was in command on U 30's first war cruise. The German Navy lists of 1936 and 1937 show Captain Lieutenant Lemp as serving in U-28, 2nd U-Boat Flotilla Salzwedel, first as Lieutenant Sir C, and later, 1st January 1937, as Oberleutnant Sir C, under Captain Lieutenant Ambrosius. The German Navy list of 1938, however, gives Lemp as commanding in 2nd U-Boat Flotilla Salzwedel. According to Petty Officer Adolf Schmidt, a prisoner of war from U-30 captured at Reykjavik on the occupation of Iceland by British forces, U-30 took part in a cruise to Spanish waters in 1938 and spent eight days at Cadiz. It is known that U-30 made three trips to Spanish waters vis-a-vis -vis from 19th August to 2nd November 1937, from 30th July to 16th August 1938, and from 5th September and 22nd October 1938. Schmidt also states that U-30 was badly rammed before the war by U-35, 
both ships being damaged, U-30 having her conning tower torn away and all her upper deck casing ripped off. U-30, added Schmidt, was in dock at the time of the maneuvers held before the war and attended by Grand Admiral Raider. First War Cruise of U-30 Notes entered in a pocket calendar by Captain Lieutenant Fritz Julius Lemp, the commanding officer, show that U-30's first war cruise to the western approaches began on 22nd August 1939, twelve days before the outbreak of war, when the U-boat left Wilhelmshaven at 0400. The officers were Captain Lieutenant Lemp, Oberleutnant Eichelburn, first engineer, and Oberleutnant Sir C. Peter Heinz, first lieutenant. According to Lemp's pocket calendar, U-30 was out in the North Sea on 25th August 1939, was awaiting position on Monday 28th August, and reached the Atlantic on 29th August. Five days later, on Sunday 3rd September, England and France declared war on Germany, and Lemp duly noted the fact in his calendar. Apparently, nothing occurred during the following week which Lemp thought worthy of notice, for there is no further entry in his calendar until Sunday, 10th September, when he records that he met U-48. The following day, Monday, 11th September, the calendar shows that U-30 sighted SS Blairlogi, 4,425 GRT, at 0330, and after chasing her for two and a half hours, finally sank her by torpedo at 0600. On Thursday, 14th September, U-30 contacted the SS Fanadhead, signaled her to heave to, and ordered the crew into the boats. According to Petty Officer Adolf Schmidt, during his later interrogation, he and a raiding named Ose were put aboard the SS Fanadhead to sink her by means of an explosive charge. While carrying out this task, they were attacked by machine gun fire by two British Skua aircraft from HMS Ark Royal. One of the aircraft was claimed to have been brought down by gunfire from U-30, and her pilot was seen to be struggling in the water. Schmidt sent Ose to the rescue, and the pilot was saved. The second Skua was then brought down by the U-boat's gunfire, and Schmidt, although wounded in the hand and forearm, succeeded in rescuing this pilot. Note. In point of fact, these two Skuas crashed because their bombs, dropped from too low an altitude, damaged them. During the attack on U-30, several of her crew injured by splinters from an aircraft bomb. Schmidt, Ose, and the two British airmen, one of whom, according to a prisoner, XU-110, was badly burned, were taken on board the U-boat. The following day, Schmidt's hand and arm grew worse as he became delirious. U-30 spent 17th and 18th September proceeding to Reykjavik, where Schmidt was put ashore on 19th September. Schmidt was immediately interned and later taken prisoner by British troops. Both he and Ose were awarded the Iron Cross second class. After the Reykjavik incident, Lemp turned for home. U-30 took eight days to complete her passage and arrived back at Wilhelmshaven on Tuesday, 27th September, taking her two British airmen prisoners with her. On the day of her return, Lemp was awarded the Iron Cross second class, and the next day he was received by Hitler. Prisoner of war Uberbootsmannmath Hermann Fox, ex U-110, who was serving in U-30 during this first war cruise, declares that U-30 sank four ships in all during this undertaking, including SS Blairlogi and SS Fanadhead, but no claims apart from the two ships' names have been entered in Captain Lieutenant Lemp's calendar. Between 18th and 30th October, Lemp 
according to his calendar, was on leave in Berlin. He gave his address, Berlin Wilmersdorf Ballenstedtike, 146, CO Dr. Stenick. At or about this time, other members of the crew of U-30 were granted periods of leave varying from 2 to 18 days. The return of Lemp to duty on 30th October appears to mark the beginning of a period of repairs and trials for U-30. On 4th and 5th November, Lemp entered Hamburg in his calendar, while on 15th November he entered Bremen. Trials apparently began on 21st November and lasted to 2nd December. Entries in Lemp's calendar are 21-11-39 Stationary Trials 28-11-39 Trimming Trials 29-11-39 First Trial 30-11-39 Docked 2-12-39 Second Trial On Sunday, 3rd December, U-30, according to the calendar, embarked torpedoes. Second War Cruise of U-30 U-30's second war cruise did not start until 9th December, over 10 weeks after her return to port. This second cruise appears scarcely to have been more than a further trial, for it lasted a mere four days. The officers were Captain Lieutenant Lemp, Oberleutnant Eichelborn, engineer, Oberleutnant Zersi Heinz. U-30 returned to port on 13th December 1939. Third War Cruise of U-30 U-30's third war cruise started on 23rd December 1939. Officers were Captain Lieutenant Lemp, Oberleutnant Engineer Eichelborn, Oberleutnant Zersi Heinz, and Lieutenant Zersi Verhofer. The first entry for this cruise in Lemp's calendar is for 25th December, on which date he writes that he attacked a tanker and missed. He adds the word aircraft. His next entry is on 26th December, when he states that U-30 was in the Fair Isle Channel. On 27th December, Lemp claims in his calendar that he sank a British patrol vessel by gunfire. Oberleutnant Engineer Eichelborn, prisoner of war X U-110, in a note to a calendar which he began on 1st January 1930, states that on 28th December 1939, at 0-330, U-30 sank the British patrol vessel Lochiel. 378 tons by gunfire. NID Note This officer was mistaken as to the identity of the ship sunk. The British patrol vessel Barbars Robinson was sunk in this vicinity on the date in question. On 28th December, Lemp wrote in his calendar that he had torpedoed HMS Barham, but the entry has been scratched out in ink. Oberleutnant Zersi Eichelborn, writing in his calendar, is again more explicit, and regarding this attack he states, on 28th December at 1545, torpedoed the battleship Barham off the west coast of Scotland. It was not, however, until 30th December that Lemp radioed the German Admiralty that he had torpedoed a battleship of the Queen Elizabeth class. Nation Oberkfreiter Stoker, first class, Koenem, prisoner of war X U-110, stated during interrogation that he had learned that U-30 fired four torpedoes at HMS Barham when at a great distance. Koenem did not join U-30 until May 1940, but there is support for his statement in a signal from N.A. Copenhagen, dated 3rd March 1940, which runs, Barham torpedoed by Lemp in a 500-ton U-boat. Four were fired at 6,000 yards. On 29th February 1940, 
the Admiralty Press Division announced. Lemp claims to have torpedoed HMS Barham. There is ample material from which to deduce the subsequent activities of U-30 during this cruise. As from the first day of the new year, 1940, two further members of the crew began to keep diaries. Oberleutnant Zersi Eichelborn begins the story by writing that he celebrated the entry of the new year sitting in the control room. Leutnant Zersi Verhofer adds the information that U-30's position on this day was southwest of Ireland. He writes, Channel for 2nd January and St. George's Channel for 4th January. On 6th January, Verhofer has entered Objective Carried Out, while Eichelborn has written On the Bottom for this date and for the two following days. The nature of the objective mentioned by Verhofer has been disclosed by Oberbootsmanmat Hermann Fox, a prisoner of war from U-110, who stated when interrogated that during this cruise in which he participated, U-30 laid mines in the St. George's Channel. This mine-laying operation did not, however, pass off peaceably for the U-boat. Verhofer has written, Proceeded out of Channel for 8th January and Western Exit of Channel for 9th January. But for this date, Eichelborn has written, obviously in some agitation of mind, 1050 alarm, a whole crowd, attacked by depth charges until 2147. We all turned pale. Nothing was broken, but we are being hunted. Damage to diving gear. NID note. HMS Vesper carried out attacks at 0010 and 0330 on 9th January 1940, 45 miles west-southwest of Land's End. These attacks were assessed, probably U-boat present, but no evidence of damage. There is no other record of any attack which could refer to this incident. The times of the attacks as noted by the German officer do not agree with Vesper's report. On the following day, Wednesday, 10th January 1940, U-30, according to Eichelborn, was proceeding submerged on a course which Verhofer describes as north. The next two days, U-30, according to Eichelborn, was able to proceed on the surface, but she submerged again on Saturday, 13th January. The next day, Eichelborn wrote, Alarm dive, aircraft, in the night. Skagrak storm. Writing of the remainder of this cruise, Eichelborn states that on Monday, 15th January, they submerged again and lay on the bottom while aircraft bombs were heard in the distance. They again submerged and lay on the bottom on the following day, but Eichelborn had the time to notice that the weather had improved, although it is horribly cold. He added, it is noticeable that we are proceeding homewards. On Wednesday, 17th January 1940, this third cruise of U-30 ended. Eichelborn writes of this day, Lovely winter weather, cold, north sea like a mill pond. Schleisen is waiting for us by the light vessel to act as icebreaker. Entered harbor at about 1700. The day after her return to port, further decorations were given to the members of U-30's crew. The unknown diarist of U-110 writes that on this day, 18th January, he received both the Iron Cross Second Class and the U-Boat Badge. Others of his entries are Saturday, 20th January, 0800, in dockyard hands. Monday, 22nd January, docking postponed until Wednesday, BBC gathering. Wednesday, 24th January, docked. On 31st January, while U-30 was still at Wilhelmshaven, a rating was transferred from U-30 to the Bremen U-boat, Babelhrung, that is, to stand by the construction of a U-boat. On 27th February, Verhofer writes, at base. Fourth 
war cruise of U-30. U-30's fourth war cruise began on 3rd March 1940 and lasted until 30th March. The officers were Captain Lieutenant Lemp, Oberleutnant Engineer Eichelborn, Oberleutnant Zersi Greger. According to a survivor from U-110, Greger had been appointed to U-30 to replace Oberleutnant Zersi Heinz, who had been transferred to a commanding officer's course. Few details are known of this cruise of U-30, apart from the fact that on 10th March, a week after she had sailed, U-30 was mentioned in preliminary orders concerning operations in Norway, allocating her to the second U-boat group together with U-34. These orders were subsequently cancelled. A survivor from U-110, who was serving in U-30 during this cruise, has stated that during March 1940, U-30 penetrated Norwegian fjords while submerged, and rising to periscope depth, obtained data regarding defenses and the number and disposition of warships and merchant vessels. This undertaking, so it was stated, was a prelude to the Norwegian invasion operations, which began on 3rd April. U-30 returned to her base at Wilhelmshaven on 30th March. 5th war cruise of U-30. U-30 began her fifth war cruise on 3rd April 1940, taking part in the Norwegian operations. Her officers were Captain Lieutenant Lemp, Oberleutnant Engineer Eichelborn, Oberleutnant Zersi Greger. Details concerning this cruise are also scarce. She was operating in an area in cooperation with U-34 and very little seems to have been achieved. U-30 returned to her base on 5th May, having been at sea one month. Sixth War Cruise of U-30 Evidence shows that U-30 began her sixth war cruise on 8th June and completed it on 7th July 1940. Officers were Captain Lieutenant Lemp, Oberleutnant Engineer Eichelburn, Oberleutnant Zersi Greger. On this cruise, U-30 left her base at Wilhelmshaven and made her way to Lorient, passing through the Fair Isle Channel, as on all her cruises to the Atlantic. A survivor from U-110, who was sailing in U-30 for the first time, stated when interrogated that during this period, U-30 operated between the North Channel, west of Ireland, and South to the neighborhood of St. George's Channel. The actions which this rating recalls, however, took place further to the south. He states that on one occasion during this cruise, when south of Ireland and the breast of North France, U-30 attacked two fast small ships in convoy whose speed he estimated at between 16 and 17 knots. After this venture, U-30 remained submerged for half a day. NID note. No report has been received which could be connected with this claim. U-30, so it was stated, also sank the Norwegian ship SS Ransfjord. NID note. SS Ransfjord was sunk at 0100 on 22nd March 1940 in approximate position 50 degrees by 45 north and 7 degrees by 45 west. This survivor stated that the final success of U-30 on this cruise was the sinking of a wheat ship, estimated as of 4,700 GRT, on 6th July, or night of 5th, 6th July. This occurred off the entrance of the South Channel. NID Note Estonian SS Vapor, 4,443 tons, sunk at 1005 on 6 July 1940 in position 49 degrees by 30 north and 9 degrees by 15 west was presumably the ship referred to as no other ship was sunk about this date in this area. U-30 took 11 torpedoes on all her cruises and on this occasion all of them were expended. U-30 reached the base at Lorient on 7th July 1940.
seventh war cruise of U-30. U-30 sailed on her seventh war cruise on 13th July 1940 and returned to port 11 days later on 24th July. The officers were Captain Lieutenant Lemp, Oberleutnant Engineer Eichelborn, Oberleutnant Zersi Gregor. This cruise began and ended at Lorient. Eleven torpedoes were again embarked, according to one passenger's statement, but only one was fired. The target was a British ship of about 3,700 GRT. This ship was first attacked by gunfire, but as she did not sink, Lemp presumed that there were empty barrels on board, and finally ordered her to be sunk by torpedo. It was believed that the crew of the British ship were picked up by a Portuguese trawler and landed at Lodzis, possibly Lexos, in Portugal. NID note. No report has been received which could be connected with this claim. After this attack, an engine room defect appears to have developed and, according to an engine room rating, U-30 was able only to proceed on one diesel. This defect presumably decided Lemp to curtail the cruise and return to Lorient after only 11 days at sea. Eighth and last war cruise of U-30 U-30 began her eighth and last war cruise on 5th August 1940 and completed it on 28th August. The officers were Captain Lieutenant Lemp, Oberleutnant Engineer Eichelborn, Oberleutnant Zersi Gregor, Lieutenant Zersi Verhofer. On this cruise, U-30 sailed from Lorient and returned to Germany by way of the Fair Isle Channel. According to a survivor from U-110, U-30 was joined on this cruise by U-A, which had come from the south of Spain, when in a position approximately 200 to 300 miles west of the Hebrides and south of Iceland, the two U-boats were said to have sighted a British convoy en route to Canada. The two U-boats proceeded to attack, and each, according to a prisoner's statement, sank two ships. U-30 was apparently detected and suffered a depth charge attack, but managed to escape. U-A, on the following day, was said to have sunk one Hungarian steamer, which had previously been attacked by U-30 on or about 21st August. It was stated that U-A had also an engine room defect. Approaching Germany, U-30 stopped at Heligoland for one night. On leaving, she was rejoined by U-A, and both sailed together for Wilhelmshaven. Later, U-30 proceeded to Stettin, where she went into dock. On this last cruise, U-30 again had 11 torpedoes on board, but only 8 were expended. Whether or not this prisoner's account of the last cruise of U-30 is complete, German propagandists decided to make considerable capital out of it. On 21st August 1940, while U-30 was still at sea, it was announced that Lemp had sunk 46,500 GRT made up of nine British ships, and that Hitler had conferred upon him the knight insignia of the Iron Cross on the recommendation of Admiral Donitz. The following day, 22nd August, the German radio announced that either Lemp or Lieb had sunk 56,000 GRT during a cruise, whereupon they had received the knight insignia of the Iron Cross. In fact, both U-boat commanders received the knight insignia on the same day, 21st August. The newspaper Westdeutsche Bockbachter of 22nd August, writing in praise of Lempf, stated that he had sunk 50,000 GRT and that, in addition, he had carried out mine-laying operations near the English coast. When Lemp finally arrived in Wilhelmshaven on 28th August, he found that, for a brief space, he was to be the hero of the hour. He was entertained by Admiral Dornitz, who, on 2nd October, accompanied Lemp, his crew, and Corvette Captain Hartmann to the Kreisheim Rutlerfeld near Neuenburg where they were guests of the party district leader of Wilhelmsburg. At this time, the newspaper Hamburger Fremdenblatt 
published a picture of Lemp in his U-boat, clearly showing on the conning tower the painted device of the front view of a terrier puppy upon a dark circular background. An engine room rating stated that it was first intended after a complete overhaul that U-30 should continue her war cruises, but finally it was decided to use her as a school boat for the Salzwedel flotilla in the Baltic, probably based on Pilau. The last known details of U-30 are contained in further entries in the diary of Oberleutnant Engineer Eichelburn, who writes that after an air raid alarm between 2045 and 0415 on 7th October, U-30 came out of dock on Saturday, 12th October, and carried out trials on February 18th October. There were further trials on Tuesday, 22nd October, when the wireless apparatus was tested. There were trimming trials at 1000 on Monday, 28th October, and more trials on Tuesday, 29th October, when the U-boat got underway at 0700. The next entry in the diary is on 2nd November, when Oberleutnant Eichelborn writes, Left Harbor. There is then a further gap until 7th December, when there is a final entry proceeded to Danzig. The following details of U-30's history have been received, but it has not been possible to ascribe the incidents to any specific crews. According to prisoners, U-30 on one occasion picked up 13 Swedish sailors on the North Sea near the Shetland Islands. The Swedish ship is alleged to have run on a floating mine, forcing them to take to the boats. On another occasion, U-30 intercepted a wireless distress signal from a Doe 18 aeroplane which had made a forced landing. U-30 was able to reach the position and pick up the crew. It was stated that U-30 frequently rescued survivors from the sea, provided them with cigarettes and spirits, and then transferred them to nearby lifeboats. U-37 it was confirmed that U-37, formerly commanded by Corvette Captain Hartmann, then by Captain Lieutenant Owen, and latterly by Oberleutnant Cersei Clausen, was about to be transferred from the 2nd Flotilla to the 24th U-Boat Flotilla, a training flotilla. She was stated, however, to have been at Lorient at the end of March 1941, but to have left before 15th April 1941, according to the claims of the German High Command. The achievements of this U-boat consist of sinkings amounting to over 100,000 tons of shipping while under the command of Hartmann, and 105 and 72 tons under Ohren. No official claims have been made on behalf of Clausen. U-38 U-38 was last heard of as having been relegated to a training flotilla in August 1940, having presumably sunk about 100,000 tons of shipping, as her captain, Captain Lieutenant Heinrich Gliebe, was awarded the knight insignia of the Iron Cross on 21st August 1940. This U-boat has, however, been allegated to the second U-boat flotilla and is still known to be commanded by Liebe. That she has carried out another war cruise is indicated by the German High Command claim of 31st May 1941 to the effect that Liebe had sunk another 44,000 tons of shipping. U-43 U-43 is known to belong to the second U-boat flotilla and to be commanded by Captain Lieutenant Luth who formerly commanded a small U-boat in which he claimed to have sunk 12 armed merchant ships, totaling 87,236 tons, and also a submarine. For these successes, he was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross on 28th October 1940. The prisoners stated that U-43 was at Lorient at the end of March 1941, but had left that base before 
15th April 1941 U-46 U-46 Oberleutnant Sir C. Engelbert Endras has apparently been active again as the German High Command communique of 4th April 1941 stated this officer's U-boat was one of those which had particularly distinguished in the achievement of the recent successes against British merchant shipping in the North Atlantic. The successes quoted were the alleged sinking of 88,616 tons of shipping, of which 10 ships totaling 58,000 tons were torpedoed and sunk in a strongly protected convoy bound for Great Britain. It was also claimed that another of 12,000 tons was severely damaged. On 14th May 1941, Endras gave a broadcast interview in which he stated that he had sunk on his latest cruise 31,500 tons of shipping, which included two tankers and one munitions ship. He professed to have been cooperating with other U-boats. The broadcast added that Endras's grand total of sinking had reached 190,000 tons, comprising 29 ships. U-48 Captain Lieutenant Herbert Schultz, known as Vati, is known to be again in command of U-48 after a prolonged absence due to illness, during which the U-boat was commanded by other officers. On 2nd April 1941, the German High Command claimed that Schultz had sunk five merchant ships, mostly in convoys totaling 35,300 tons in the North Atlantic, and had torpedoed another big merchant ship whose loss could be assumed. This ship was described in a broadcast from Zissin and having a displacement of 6,000 tons. On 17th April 1941, Schultz broadcast an interview in which he claimed to have attacked and shelled a 10,000-ton British ship proceeding to Great Britain with a cargo of munitions. On 18th April 1941, Breslau broadcast an alleged interview with survivors of the British ship said to have been landed at the Cape Verde Islands. This broadcast claimed that British survivors had described the U-boat as having attacked on the surface and the German shells as having exploded the cargo of ammunition. A broadcast from Rome gave Schultz's total sinking up to 22nd April 1941 as 16 ships amounting to 114,500 tons. U-52 Survivors from U-100 stated that Captain Lieutenant Salman was in command of U-52 but that this officer had been or was expected to be given a new U-boat when U-52 would be relegated to the training flotilla. The only official claim made on behalf of Salman was on 14th August 1940 when he was stated to have sunk 41,611 tons of shipping, including a British auxiliary cruiser of 11,400 tons. Survivors of U-110 believe that Salman's total was now about 98,000 tons, of which 18,000 tons were attributed to his last cruise. A prisoner asserted that while U-110 was on her last cruise, 15th April to 9th May 1941, she intercepted a message from U-52 reporting the sinking of 18,000 tons. This man added that U-52 had been on her way to Germany to become a training U-boat after seeing much active service since the outbreak of the war. U-67 Captain Lieutenant Heinrich Blechroth is known to be in command of U-67 of the second U-boat flotilla. According to the German High Command, claim of 21st September 1940, this officer sank nine ships totaling 51,862 tons. A further announcement of 18th October 1940 stated that he had sunk 42,000 tons of shipping on what seems to have been his next cruise. This brought his grand total of shipping sunk to 
93,862 tons. On 21st October 1940, official sources increased the tonnage sunk on his latest cruise to 53,000 tons. On 28th October 1940, Bleichroth was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross and the German High Command stated that he had sunk on two cruises, 15 steamers, and two tankers totaling 105, 396 tons, mainly in convoys, and also the British gunboat Dundee. NID note, HMS Dundee was sunk at 0020 on 15th September 1940 in position 56 degrees by 50 north and 15 degrees by 4 west. Prisoners stated that U-67 was on a cruise during May 1941. U-93 The award of the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross to Captain Lieutenant Korth, announced on 3rd June 1941, indicates that this officer is credited with having sunk about 100,000 tons or more of shipping. He is known to be in command of U-93. U-94 It was confirmed that U-94 was commanded by Captain Lieutenant Herbert Kupich. On 9th May 1941, the Germans officially claimed that Kupich had recently sunk four merchant ships totaling 20,000 tons in a strongly protected convoy in the North Atlantic. On 25th May 1941, he was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross and the German radio broadcast that altogether he had sunk a destroyer and 17 armed merchant ships totaling 90,260 tons and had also carried out mining operations close to the British coast. Mining operations would have been undertaken in a smaller U-boat at an earlier date. U-96 On 20th May 1941, the German High Command claimed that Lehman Willenbrock's U-boat had sunk in convoys British tankers totaling 33,000 tons. This officer is known to command U-96. U-98 Prisoners claimed to have seen U-98, Captain Lieutenant Geisei, together with two or three other 500-ton U-boats at Lorient early in April 1941. U-101 Captain Lieutenant Mengerson is known to be in command of U-101. The German High Command communique of 3rd December 1940 claimed that on 2nd December 1940, U-boats had attacked and dispersed with particular success a large convoy destined for Great Britain, and despite immediate and violent defense by the escorting cruisers and destroyers, had sunk 15 merchant ships totaling over 110,000 tons, also the auxiliary cruiser HMS Caledonia of 17,000 tons. Mengerson was said to have played the leading part by sinking five of the above ships with a total tonnage of 41,000 tons. U-103 It was established that Captain Lieutenant Victor Schutz is in command of U-103 and not of U-104, as stated by a surviving officer of U-76. The exploits mentioned in Charlie Baker 405121, under the heading U-104, therefore refer to U-103. The German High Command communique of 27th May 1941 claimed that Schutz's U-boat had specially distinguished itself by sinking 11 ships totaling 51,200 tons on the occasion when U-boats sank 14 heavily laden merchant ships totaling 77,600 tons off the west coast of Africa. U-103 is described as having been a directing boat, Ferrungsboot, and together with U-68 and U-704 is fitted with an extra-large freshwater tank. U-105 The German High Command communique of 17th May 1941 claimed that Captain Lieutenant George Shue's U-boat had sunk five British merchant ships totaling 33,000 tons. The German press of the same date 
corrected this figure to 33,612 tons. It is known that Shu commands U-105. A German broadcast of 25th May 1941 claimed that Shu had so far sunk 14 armed merchant ships totaling 96,112 tons and had carried out successfully some special operations. On the same date, he was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross. U-106 It was established that U-106 is commanded by Captain Lieutenant Jürgen Osten. The German High Command communique of 22nd March 1941 stated that the U-boats commanded by Osten and Schu had particularly distinguished themselves in the attack on a British convoy off the west coast of Africa, when U-boats had sunk 11 ships totaling 77,000 tons by shadowing a convoy for several days and making repeated attacks. NID note, two convoys, Sugar London 67 and Sugar London 68, were involved and 11 ships were sunk with a loss of 64,883 tons. On 2nd April, 1941, Osten was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross. The German broadcast stating his total sinkings amounted to 92,000 tons of shipping. U-107 It was established that Captain Lieutenant Hessler is in command of U-107 and not Captain Lieutenant Schultz as stated by survivors of U-76. Charlie Baker 405121 According to the German High Command communique of 1st May 1941, Hessler reported the sinking of a 7,000-ton steamer, which brought his U-boat's total up to 42,650 tons during that cruise. U-108 Captain Lieutenant Schultz whom earlier prisoners thought to be in command on U-107 is now known to command U-108. Schultz broadcast on 9th May 1941 his experiences on his first cruise. He stated that his U-boat and his crew were both new and they proceeded to the Atlantic where they cruised for eight days before being able to fire a torpedo. Then they sighted a column of smoke maneuvered into position and attacked at night. As their victim did not sink at once, the U-boat surfaced and shelled the heavily laden ship, which had been bound for England until she sank. Schultz claimed to have subsequently sunk further merchant ships on that cruise. U-123 Captain Lieutenant Moll is known to command U-123. This officer was credited by the German High Command on 19th October 1940 with having sunk seven ships totaling 44,050 tons when German official sources claimed the sinking within a few days of 31 merchant ships amounting to 173,650 tons of which 26 ships were stated to have been in convoy. It was not confirmed that the successes claimed above on behalf of Moll were achieved in U-123. The sinking of four further merchant ships totaling 33,100 tons was attributed to Moll by the German High Command on 24th February 1941, and it was added that this officer had then sunk 19 merchant ships amounting to 111,943 tons. Breslau broadcast an announcement on 28th February 1941 to the effect that Moll had been awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross. Survivors of U-110 claimed to have seen U-123 and Moll at Lorient early in April 1941. They added that she left before 15th April 1941. U-124 the captain of U-124 was known to be Captain Lieutenant Wilhelm Schultz, see Charlie Baker 405120. He was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross on 7th April 1941, having sunk, according to German claims, 
16 armed merchant vessels totaling over 100,000 tons. The statement added that this officer had always been eager to attack with his U-boat and had achieved that excellent result by determinedly making use of all possibilities of attack. U-201 U-201, Oberleutnant Zersi, Albert Schnee, as mentioned earlier in this report, surfaced close to U-110 in the forenoon of 9th May 1941, and a conference was held by the two captains. It was arranged, according to prisoners, that U-201 should attack half an hour after U-110. U-110 attacked convoy Obo Baker 3110 on 9th May 1941, at 1400 BST, and at 1436 SS Empire Cloud and SS Gregalia were torpedoed. The former ship subsequently towed to port. U-201 was stated by prisoners to be a new 500-ton U-boat on her first cruise. Schnee is known to enjoy a reputation in U-boat circles as an efficient and valuable officer. U-556 It was established that U-556 is commanded by Captain Lieutenant Herbert Wolfarf, who is stated by the German High Command on 25th May 1941 to have sunk 18 merchant ships totaling 75,477 tons while commanding a small U-boat at an earlier date. The communique added that this officer had sunk a further four merchant ships amounting to 18,500 tons in his present U-boat, and that his grand total of 93,977 tons of shipping sunk comprised of 22 ships, including an escort vessel. He was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross. This U-boat was sunk on 27th June 1941. Full particulars of her activities will be found in Charlie Baker 405126 in process of production. UA Prisoners stated that they saw UA at Lorient on a date during the time U110 was there from 29th March to 15th April 1941. A chief petty officer said that this large U-boat was operating in the South Atlantic and could remain at sea for three months. These statements were not confirmed. UA is attached to the second U-boat flotilla based on Lorient. She is under the command of Corvette Captain Eckerman, formerly commanding the Los U-boat flotilla. UB Prisoners stated that the captured submarine HMS SEAL is in service in the German Navy under the name UB. Italian U-Boats The survivors of U-110, like prisoners captured at earlier dates, referred to their Italian allies in terms of the utmost contempt, a special scorn being reserved for Italian U-Boat crews. One man indignantly described the Italian U-boats as usually sinking an intercepted vessel by gunfire after rescuing as many of the crew as possible. After hastily returning to port, the Italians then triumphantly exhibited the unfortunate prisoners and spent weeks celebrating their achievement. Prisoners estimated the total sinkings of the whole U-boat branch of the Italian Navy as 300,000 tons. Section 10. U-Boat Losses U-44 Buildings in Lorient, occupied by U-Boat personnel, have been named after U-Boat captains lost during this war. The naming of one of these buildings after Captain Lieutenant Ludwig Mathis indicated that he has been lost. Survivors of U-110 stated that this officer was lost when U-44 was sunk. The suggestion that this U-boat had been sunk in March or April 1940 was mentioned in Charlie Baker 405115. U-47 
the German High Command communique of 23rd March 1941 announced that the U-boat commanded by Corvette Captain Gunther Prien had not returned from her last undertaking and must be considered lost. Prisoners had stated that rumors of the loss of Prien had been current at Lorient for some time, but that no details were known. According to a theory held by the German naval authorities based on unconfirmed reports of a steamer which had reached a Canadian port, this ship was alleged to have seen a U-boat surfacing only four meters from her bow and to have rammed this U-boat, which then sank immediately. The Vice Admiral U-Boats was said to have thought that the U-boat was possibly Prien's. It is thought probable, however, that U-47 was in point of fact sunk by HMS Wolverine on 8th March 1941. U-57. Further statements were made regarding the sinking of U-57, reported in Charlie Baker 405121. According to survivors of U-110, this seems to have occurred in Kiel Bay, near the entrance to the south of the Kiel Canal. U-104. A petty officer of U-110 stated that U-104 had been sunk. Another petty officer said that Captain Lieutenant Jurst had been lost on a 750-ton U-boat, which he believed was U-104. This tends to confirm the loss of U-104, which must therefore have occurred between the end of October 1940 and the end of January 1941. Jurst is known to have been in Kiel at the end of October and was overdue in 29th January 1941. It thus seems that the U-boat sunk by HMS Rhododendron on 21st November 1940 was U-104 and not U-59 as suggested on page 18 of Charlie Baker 405121. U-551 Prisoners stated that they saw U-551 in the Baltic about New Year 1941. It was established that she was commanded by Captain Lieutenant Robert Schrott and had recently been lost. A survivor of U-110 claimed to have had a friend on board. The Germans knew only of the actual fact but no details of this loss except that there were no survivors. U-551 was carrying out a cruise during March and was due to return in April. It is probable that she was the U-boat sunk by HMS trawler Vicenda on 23rd March 1941. Section 11. U-boat bases. Kiel. German Air Force prisoners interrogated recently stated that major damage had been caused at the Germania yard by British air raids. The pattern shop there was said to have been completely wrecked. U-boat prisoners confirmed statements that the town itself had also suffered considerable damage. Wilhelmshaven Great damage was admitted to have been wrought by British air raids to the whole of the naval dockyards. Provision and equipment sections were said to have suffered greatly and large quantities of clothing material have been destroyed. It was added that 5,000 men were out of work after the air raids in January 1941. Pilau It was stated that the U-boat school at Pilau consisted of two sections, one for training upper deck personnel and one for technical personnel. Emden Prisoners expressed surprise at the frequent bombing of Emden, as there were never any U-boats there. They denied that this place was used as a U-boat base. Lorient It was stated that no U-boat shelters have been constructed at Lorient, although much building of various kinds was being done. Prisoners stated that U-boats never trimmed down during air raids. Photographs taken from prisoners showed U-boats camouflaged by net coverings. It was added that no U-boat had yet been hit during British air raids at Lorient, 
but some bombs dropped on 10th April 1941 were described as near misses. On this occasion, between 10 and 15 dud bombs were said to have fallen in the town. At Lorient, the various buildings housing U-boat personnel have been renamed after famous U-boat captains of the Great War, and the wings of these barracks have been named after U-boat captains lost in this war. Thus the harbor barracks, now known as the Salzfedel barracks, are divided into three wings, namely the north wing, or Haus Habkost, the east wing, or Haus Vondretsky, and south wing, or Haus Fraulich. These barracks, formerly known as the Arsenal, were shown as numbers 7 and 8 on the map of Lorient published in CB 4051-15, opposite page 27. The former school of music, requisitioned to accommodate U-boat ratings, is now known as the Hundius Barracks, and the three wings are the House Bedun, the House Barton, and the House Mugler. Buildings at the autobus station near the railway station are the House Mathis and House Lof. One of these is a large yellow house. The U-boat staff have been accommodated in an establishment known as the Haus Jurst. The former railway home at Quiberon has become the U-boat holiday home Quiberon. The officers are quartered either in the Hotel Beau Sejour, Hotel Central, Haus Mathis, or in the officers' home. Senior petty officers are accommodated in Haus Lof or in Haus Jurst. Petty officers and men are quartered in the Salzfedel barracks. The officer of the patrol and petty officer live in Block Vondretsky in the Salzfedel barracks. A holiday home at Quiberon, possibly that mentioned above, was said to have been destroyed in a British air attack a day before a returning U-boat's crew was due to arrive for a rest. This statement was not confirmed. Another holiday home, is known to have been instituted at Karnak. The behavior in Lorient and other French towns of U-boat crews and of the flying personnel of the German Air Force was said to be good, but that the German army was strongly criticized, the soldiers, anti-aircraft gunners, etc. were described as being a drunken lot. Several prisoners claimed that they had been the first U-boat crew to reach Lorient as these men formerly served in U-30. This indicated that the first U-boat to put into Lorient was U-30 on 7th July 1940. On one occasion, during an air raid, some petty officers quartered near the railway station went out into the street and were fired on from a nearby house. Section 12. General Remarks on U-Boats U-boat attacks on destroyers. The chief quartermaster of U-110 stated that a U-boat would only attack a destroyer while the latter was heading for the U-boat, provided that the destroyer had not yet sighted the U-boat. If, however, the destroyer had sighted the U-boat, then the latter would at once crash dive to a considerable depth. Diving depth of U-boats. It was again stated that the building yards guaranteed a diving depth of 100 meters, 328 feet, with a 50% safety margin, so that a depth of 150 meters, 492 feet, was in practice still safe. Camouflaging of U-Boats Whilst U-110 was carrying out exercises in the Baltic, her conning tower was slightly camouflaged by a band across the conning tower and something representing a bow wave. This camouflage was so ineffective that the crew of the Schleswig Holstein thought it was but a distinguishing sign indicating that the CO of U-110 had the knight insignia of the Iron Cross. This camouflage was removed at Pilau and was not replaced. Shepka's U-boat, U-100, was painted light battleship gray and had as camouflage irregular patches of a darker gray-blue. A few other U-boats 
have dark oblique stripes apparently made with a blower, but camouflage was generally considered ineffective. There is no general order in regard to camouflage, and the matter is left entirely in the hands of the U-boat commander. Cruises to Equatorial Waters It was stated that U-boats, proceeding as far south as the equator, could remain at sea for 12 weeks and were refueled by a supply ship. It was emphatically denied that they were ever put into neutral harbors or even isolated inlets. Reliability of German Air Force Reports on Convoys The chief quartermaster of U-110 declared that German Air Force reports on convoys were usually unreliable and on many occasions had proved quite incorrect. He insisted, however, that reports sent by U-boats regarding the position, speed, and course of convoys were very reliable. Training U-boats an experienced chief petty officer stated that at least 30 U-boats were being used for training purposes, but that this number was inadequate. Vitamin tablets for U-boat personnel A petty officer admitted that tablets containing vitamins are issued to U-boat crews. He believed that such tablets had a steadying effect on the men's nerves. Gestapo in U-boats the suggestion that any member of the crew of a U-boat was responsible for reports to the Gestapo was strenuously denied. The officers were indignant at the suggestion that a German naval officer would tolerate any system of secret surveillance. Leave for U-boat personnel It was stated that U-boat personnel get three times as much leave as other naval men. Section 13 Propaganda Company. A survivor of U-110 was a war correspondent of the PK Propaganda Company. This man, Helmut Eck, aged 23, was born in Berlin and has lived there all his life with his parents. He is unmarried. At the age of 18, he joined the popular Berlin morning newspaper BZ am Mittag, published by the Dutcher Verlag, formerly Ulstein Verlag, as a probationary reporter. He appears to have worked well for three years ago when he was still 20. He was offered the post of assistant to the correspondent of the BZ am Mittag in London. This post carried with it a salary of 600 marks a month, a substantial sum for a German journalist. Eck was, however, unable to accept the position as he had first to complete his compulsory service with the Labour Corps and with the armed forces. In 1938, Eck finished his term with the Labour Corps and joined the army. He was allocated to a Panzer Regiment. In March 1939, he took part in the occupation of Czechoslovakia by German troops as a motorcyclist attached to a Panzer company. He says... He lost his way in Bohemia and was actually the first German soldier to enter Prague. Eck remained with the German army throughout the summer of 1939 and shortly before the outbreak of war he was drafted to the Polish frontier. He took part in the Polish campaign still as a motorcyclist and rode with the German columns from the western frontier to the east, where they came in contact with advancing Russians whereupon they withdrew. His company then returned to Germany and was not in action again until the following May when they were in the vanguard of the German advance across France. The drive of his particular unit ended at San Florentin where they were able to capture a large tank farm intact. According to Eck, the French had only attempted to destroy one tank by firing machine gun bullets into it and as the tank had not caught fire, they were able to plug the leaks. Eck remained with the German Army of Occupation in France until last winter, when he was transferred to the Propaganda Company, by reason of his previous experience as a journalist. He reported to Army Headquarters, OKW, in Paris, and at his own request was transferred to the naval branch of the PK. He was sent to Boulogne in 
February and spent six weeks in a German patrol vessel, an experience which he described as intensely boring as we saw no action of any kind. Although he had been given honorary rank as Leutnant Zersi, Eck was still wearing his Lance Corporal's uniform. During this period, Eck wrote four articles for his paper describing the life of the crew. He submitted these articles to the headquarters censorship when he returned to port, but he does not know if they were ever published. Returning to Paris, Eck volunteered to go on a war cruise in a U-boat, although he had never seen a U-boat before in his life, and he was accordingly sent to Lorient, where he remained until U-110 sailed on 15th April 1941. Eck stated that the Propaganda Company number between two and three thousand men, but of these not more than three hundred are engaged in the front line as reporters and cameramen. The remainder are technical assistants, laboratory attendants, stenographers, telephonists, and sub-editors. Casualties among the frontline PK men have been far higher than in any other unit of the German armed forces. Figures published in the German press in February 1940, before the start of the Western Offensive, give the number of killed as 28 out of an estimated 100. Since this time, according to Eck, the strength of the frontline men has been trebled. Eck sets the casualties of his Panzer Company during the drive against France at not more than 10%, although we were in the thick of the fighting. The chief of the naval branch of the propaganda company was Corvette Captain Heinz, a retired officer who served in the last war. Under Heinz, as chief of the PK, men attached to U-boats, is journalist named Frank. Frank has accompanied both Prien and Kretschmer on war cruises and has been awarded the Iron Cross Second Class and the U-boat badge, although not participating as an active member of the crew. Frank no longer goes on war cruises. His headquarters are at Kiel. He has written at least three books on U-boats in action. Chief of the PK men attached to the Lorient U-boat base is Herbert Cohn. Cohn accompanied Captain Lieutenant Schonder on war cruises in a small U-boat last autumn. He has ceased going to sea. Of 14 PK men at Lorient, only three, including Eck, were allowed to go to sea. PK men attached to the Navy are given honorary rank as Leutnants or Sea. They have no distinctive badge on their uniform. They need not necessarily have any sea experience or any special qualifications. PK men attached to the Army must have completed their two years compulsory military service. They wear an armlet on their left sleeves bearing the words Propaganda Company. They are granted no special rank, and there are PK men in all ranks from Lance Corporal to Major. PK men attached to the Air Force are given special training as machine gunners. Eck does not know if the Air Force PK men have any distinctive markings on their uniform. PK men are only subject to full military discipline when they are on active service. When their particular assignment is finished, they either return to special bases or go on leave until they are required again. Eck said that at the PK base at Lorient, eight of the fourteen men there were quartered in a villa at Larman Plage, and the remaining six in a nearby hotel. Their needs were attended to by four French girls who mothered them most efficiently. The six senior men, including Eck, each had a car and driver of his own. This would intimate that there is no drastic shortage of petrol. Eck, though still wearing his Lance Corporal's uniform, had as his driver Corporal Baron von der Heidt. PK reports, films, and photographs are censored by a special army headquarters, OKW, office but only information of use to the enemy is deleted. There appears to be no supreme military head of the propaganda company, and this office had been assumed by Dr. Goebbels, although he has not been nominated to it. Section 14. 
conditions in concentration camps. Although many prisoners of war have denied almost all knowledge of conditions inside concentration camps, a certain amount of information has been divulged by various men when no witnesses were present. Only the most reliable statements have been noted. Among the crimes for which persons are frequently sent to concentration camps, often without any trial or hearing whatsoever, are high treason, Hochverrat, treason to their country, Landsverrat, and merely resistance, Widerstand. One man was thrown into a camp without a trial for many months. From time to time he was cross-examined and on each occasion was flogged with whips made of ox-hide thongs. The camp was a derelict factory in northern Germany. Each man had a palias and only one blanket, although there was no heating. There was one small washroom and one laboratory for about 100 men. About 20 of these were communists, and there were also some Jews. There were many more guards than prisoners. The food consisted of coffee and dry bread for breakfast, a kind of meatless pea soup for lunch, and coffee and dry bread for supper. Visits from relatives were permitted for five minutes every 21 days, but SS men were always present and the prisoner was separated from his visitor by a space of about 15 feet. Unspeakable cruelties were practiced, such as forcing the prisoner to lie down on a floor covered with broken glass. Any attempt to push aside the glass was discouraged by flogging with riding whips. Party officials in one town, after a night of revelry, used to take their wives and friends out to the local concentration camp at four o'clock in the morning. They would sit at tables in the exercise hall and order drinks. The prisoners, awakened by revolver shots at the ceiling of their sleeping quarters, which brought down lumps of plaster on their heads, would then be driven into the exercise hall by guards armed with whips and revolvers and forced to drill in front of the drunken crowd. In the Orienburg concentration camp, 1,200 socialist democrats and communists were made to lie flat on their backs side by side, and then SS men in field boots and full equipment goose-stepped over the prostrate bodies. In another camp, air raid drill would be practiced in the middle of the night. Large numbers of naked, terrified prisoners, half mad with terror, would try to rush through a small doorway and get stuck. At every corner they had to pass, there were SS men who lashed them with whips. Finally, about 80 prisoners were driven into a small cellar where they were locked up until they almost suffocated. Instances were cited of men being bayoneted in the legs because they could not run fast enough. Many hundreds of internees were shot out of hand. Others, when subsequently examined by doctors, had to have lumps of decomposed flesh cut out. Specially prepared chicken skin had to be grafted to heal these grievous injuries. The men in charge of many concentration camps were persons of criminal tendencies and pathological sadists. They used their power to amass huge fortunes. One simple method of enriching themselves was to arrest any man believed to be well-to-do and then extort money from the relatives by promising to set the prisoner free. Such cruelty and blackmail were practiced that even German public opinion sometimes became sufficiently outraged to oblige higher authorities to take note of the more notorious camps and the men running them. Sometimes there would be a clean-up. Many prisoners proved innocent would be liberated, while the men in charge of the camps would be sentenced to long periods of imprisonment, but as soon as the scandal had blown over, these men would be liberated and be given good appointments, such as chief magistrates by the Nazi party in another part of Germany. One of the worst concentration camps was said to be on the Tuffelsmoor on the Dutch frontier. Relatives of interned men were sometimes told to come and fetch their relations home, and on arrival were handed an urn containing the prisoners' ashes. 
Liberated prisoners sometimes returned home to find their relatives' hair had turned white from worry, and sometimes that their relatives had become insane and had been placed in asylums. Appendix 1 Translation of a diary written by the chief quartermaster of U-110 after his capture. 8th May, 1941 At 18.10, Vessel reported with high upper works. As it is difficult to make out what she is, we assume that she is a battleship, but this proves later to be wrong. We follow astern of her and keep in touch. The wind is increasing and the sea becomes heavier. After an hour, we have made out her course and speed. 720 degrees, 7 knots. Nothing is to be seen of the convoy, only destroyers. We seem to be north of the convoy, and somewhat ahead of it. We proceed at slow speed until the destroyer comes in sight, then increase to three-fifth speed and keep away. Visibility is poor. 9th May, 1941 At 0, 0, 0000, on the 9th May, 1941, we proceed on an opposite course, 90 degrees, as we have seen nothing more of the convoy since 2200. Nothing is to be seen. The convoy has disappeared. There are two possibilities. Either the convoy has altered course to the north or to the south. It is extremely improbable that she has gone northwards, so we decide to proceed to the south. At 0100, our course is 200 degrees, and we are proceeding at 4 fifth speed. At 0200, we alter course at 180 degrees, in the meantime, it has become dark, but there is some moonlight and visibility seems to be improving. At 0300, there is nothing to be seen. We submerge and listen on our listening apparatus. The convoy can be heard 40 degrees to port at a distance of about three miles. We surface in order to follow her. Tanks are blown, but the bow wave of a destroyer can clearly be seen in the moonlight. So we submerge again. There is great tension, and we wonder if we have been sighted. But she turns away, and we blow tanks again. Then we continue to keep in touch. But in spite of every endeavor, we only sight destroyers. At last, at 0430, we have crept up so close that we can recognize the merchant vessels, about 40 or 50 of them. After a short discussion, an attack for this night is abandoned. A surface attack cannot be carried out on account of the strong escort, and for an attack submerged, the light is too bad. We prefer to wait until the following night, hoping that the convoy may then be without any escort. The course of the convoy is 240 degrees, speed 8 knots. We continue to keep in touch. At 0900, I turn in. At 12.30, I am awakened. The order comes, action stations. So the game is beginning. The morale among the trained ratings is not too good. They are convinced that we shall be caught. At 12.37, we submerge, and we intend to creep inside the convoy. At 12.45, the convoy is sighted. We are at periscope depth, and the captain is at the periscope. There is considerable excitement among the crew. Everyone prepares himself in his thoughts to abandon ship. I don't notice anything of the attack, as I am not in the control position. All of a sudden, about 13.10, comes the order to submerge. At 13.12, the first depth charges explode, but they cause no damage. Nevertheless, there is a feeling of depression on the boat. From our listening apparatus, we establish the fact that we are being hunted by three destroyers. And then at 1325 comes the end. We are enveloped in a whole series of accurately placed depth charges. The boat is terribly shaken, and it seems as though all the instruments are out of action. Chlorine gas is escaping, and then the captain gives the order to blow the tanks, but the blower has been smashed. The batteries are out of action, and there seems scarcely any possibility of reaching the surface. A very bitter end. 
We are slowly sinking, and then suddenly the boat begins to roll. For some inexplicable reason, the boat reaches the surface. The captain opens the conning tower hatch and gives the order, Abandon ship. Appendix 2. List of surviving crew of U-110, etc. Officers, 4. Petty officers, 12. Men, 16. Total, 32. Following did not survive, etc. Officers, 1. Petty officers, 3. Men, 11. Total, 15. Total crew, officers, 5. Petty officers, 15. Men, 27. Total, 47.